Economics is often seen as a very technical and complex discipline, far too difficult for the average person to understand. And while there are complexities and subtleties of this science still being discovered today, the basics can be understood by most anyone who will take a minimum amount of time. One does not have to be a biologist or a physician to understand the basics of healthy living. Many of today's economic problems can be understood with the same level of intelligence and study required of a person who would begin a health regimen by reviewing his diet and exercise habits. Economics in One Lesson is an introduction to free market economics written by Henry Hazlitt and published in 1946. It was based on Frederick Bastiat's essay, What is Seen and what is not seen. Henry Hazlitt was born November 28, 1894. He was an American economist, economic historian, and journalist for such publications as the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, Newsweek, and the American Mercury, among others. He died July 8, 1993. His economic writings were influenced mostly by Ludwig von Mises, perhaps the most famous of the Austrian economists. Most of today's free market economists are proponents of the Austrian school, and von Mises reviewed and approved of economics in one lesson prior to its publication. The novelist Ayn Rand was a friend of both Hazlitt and his wife Frances, and it was Hazlitt who introduced Mises to Rand, the two figures who would become most associated with the defense of pure laissez-faire capitalism. Ludwig von Mises, Ayn Rand, and Henry Hazlitt were influenced greatly by another champion of liberty, Frederick Bastiat. He was a French assemblyman during the 1840s and his most famous work is The Law, an essay that defines, through development, a just system of laws and then demonstrates how such law facilitates a free society. Bastiat introduces the concept of the broken window in his essay, What is Seen and What is Not Seen. Before we start, it is appropriate to define economics. Von Mises, in his monumental work, Human Action, says that economics is causality, or the study of cause and effect. And he says that it applies to every human action and not just the financial or production activities we normally associate with economics. Hazlitt states that the study of economics concerns itself with the immediate and the secondary effects of any causative action. It looks at what is easily seen, but it also logically pursues those effects that are not readily seen. It identifies the groups meant to be affected by the action, but it also looks at the effects on all groups. These factors form Hazlitt's definition of economics. The art of economics consists in looking not merely at the immediate, but at the longer effects of any act or policy. It consists in tracing the consequences of that policy not merely for one group, but for all groups. This brings us to Bastiat's basic lesson. Envision a bakery with a front window. A young vandal throws a stone through the window which becomes the cause of some economic effects. The window needs to be replaced. Clearly, what is seen is that the glazier has an economic benefit and he, in turn, spends his newly obtained money benefiting others in the community. Should the vandal be punished or rewarded? 
After all, it seems that his action has been good for the local economy. But what is not seen is that the baker was saving for a new suit and now cannot afford to purchase it. The glazier's gain seems to be the tailor's loss and his plans for spending his money acquired from the sale of the suit need to be canceled. All that has changed is who received the $200 from the baker and whose spending would stimulate the economy. From the baker's point of view it is pretty simple. If the window had not been broken he would have both a window and a new suit. Now he has only the window. The overall wealth of the economy is $200 less. Punish the vandal. While this may seem obvious, it is surprising how often it is misunderstood. Last summer I was having lunch with a township supervisor who made the comment, the oil rig explosion in the Gulf of Mexico was good for the economy. He pointed out that people were working on the beaches cleaning up, that many people had been hired for various jobs that otherwise would not have been hired. What he didn't realize is that they were simply the glaziers. In a complex economy, it is not as easy to see the tailors, the people that would have benefited, other than the owners of the rig, of course. But the owners of the rig would have spent their money elsewhere. Of course, in the real world, it is harder to trace because of the insurance settlements, government emergency aid, and other legal remedies, but other effects still exist, and the overall economy is less wealthy and not more wealthy. In our example, let's substitute the taxpayer for the baker. One of the economic myths we hear is that war is good for the economy. It is easy to see that companies supplying war weapons and ammunition will benefit. The war machine generates much economic activity. But what is not seen is what could have been produced in those factories and with that money if the peace machine were allowed to operate. The overall wealth of the economy is greater with peace. Stimulus programs supposedly generate economic gain, and they do for those contractors lucky enough or well-connected enough to get the contracts. This is easily seen. More difficult to see is what would be done with the money if it were not spent in this fashion. Again, it is harder to trace the money trail. The government can tax to get the money, it can borrow it, or it can print it. But no matter how it gets the money, real value is diverted and consumer-driven decisions are affected. Politicians love to be seen as proactive. Doing something seems to be politically better than doing nothing. So it is no surprise that they would create actions like cash for clunkers, which destroyed usable cars, reducing wealth in the economy in order to have an effect that is readily seen. The bridge to nowhere benefited a few contractors a great deal at the spread out expense of taxpayers who didn't even hear about the project. Bank bailouts, easily seen effects, but the enormous cost will never be traced, but logically it exists. Other schemes and studies and grants certainly help some. But what if those dollars could have been spent by the people who produced them for what they would have preferred? We can summarize by reintroducing the various players in our broken window story and identify the corresponding components in the real world application. First, we have the glazier. He was the innocent beneficiary of the action. In our broken window story, he was innocent. But what if he paid the vandal to break the window? In the real world applications, 
he can be any of the countless beneficiaries of government spending. We need a military capability, but we wouldn't want the factory owners to lobby for war just to improve business. Roads, bridges, schools are all legitimate recipients of government spending, if they are warranted. Certainly not legitimate as stimulus projects. In our story, the tailor was the one who lost out, but it could have been a vacation that had to be canceled, or a new pet, or investment. The baker's money went somewhere less beneficial to his wants and desires. In the real world application, who knows what would have been done with the money, but even if it is put in the bank, it has positive economic benefits. They just aren't as apparent. The next player is the victim, the baker, or in our world, the taxpayer. He has to sacrifice what he would have desired for something else. Lastly, we have the causing action, the vandal or politician, who oftentimes is in cahoots with the glazier. The politician gets to direct the flow of spending and usually receives political rewards when he should be receiving political punishment. This government leader either doesn't understand or simply ignores a pretty simple economic lesson. This lesson has been given credibility by many economists and is often referred to by the politicians opposing the government stimulus program. Politicians, eager for control of spending projects and hoping to reward their special interests, have ignored this simple lesson for more than 150 years. The body of knowledge is expanding at a faster and faster pace, but what good is that if we ignore new information? When Columbus sailed out of a Spanish port in 1492 in search of India, many thought he would fall off the earth. I don't know how many years it took, but it wasn't long before people accepted that the earth was round. Advances in every academic endeavor are debated prior to being accepted, but once accepted, they provide the new base from which we operate, with the exception of economics. When it comes to economics, the debate never ends, and in this case, it is not even entered into. To accept the truth of this simple lesson would require the politicians to admit there is no reason for them to spend your money on their projects rather than to have you spend it on yours.